Questions or comments from the material recorded in my absence? Well, actually, it wasn't absent to do it, but last week. Yeah. I was curious when that the whole like gang situation was happening in June. When that when time, when time that was. Well, it still is. Which is actually part of the analysis that we do in the 21st century now, but part of. Um, did I talk about Thrasher last? Maybe I haven't. Maybe we do that in the 90s. But just to do a quick and dirty with your question. Drug dealing gangs have been part of the American landscape for 170 years. 170 years. I didn't stutter. 170 years. Right? Now, the early, so, and academics, because this is a college class, academics have been studying them as a phenomenon. Now, when I told you about what anthropology is, anthropology is the science within Western civilization that studies other cultures, but doesn't study itself, or actually didn't start studying itself till post-World War II. What's called post-modernism, all right? So one of the things they're not going to look at as anthropologists is what is it about this particular culture that causes us to speak this language that makes people go off? Like, how do you explain white supremacy? Well, actually, that's not a question that white supremacy asks itself. It considers itself normal. So it's people of color that ask, where'd they get the idea that they had to be superior to everybody else? I mean, we've all kind of gone through that delusion and we outgrew it. But they did not, or there are some of us that get infected with it. So rather than go off on that, the whole gang thing started out because you have a society based on divisions. So you can either have an economy in which everybody has access to the things that they need, or you don't, where some people have access to the things they need. Now, if other people don't have access to the things they need, so if you got create a haves or have not instead of everybody having, right? or you take care of the people that can't take care of themselves, or you leave them out in the wilderness to die, or whatever. So you have, you cre capitalism cre has to have haves and have nots. I'm not coming from a socialist perspective, I'm just saying, look, you need, you can't have universal employment in capitalism. You need unemployed people. Not just, and that's unemployed people relative to the above ground legal economy. Okay? That's unemployed relative to that. What if people still need to have their needs met? How are they going to do it? Duh. Illegal. You've got above ground and you've got underground. Yeah, you've got above ground and underground. So now you got underground. But the underground economy, if you listen to the press, it makes it sound like it's only been around since the 60s or the 50s or the 40s. No. Drug dealing gangs have been part of America for 170 years. Now, if you think about 170 years ago, what was going on, well, they're not talking about slavery. Well, slaves are slaves. And they're part of that economy. Hey, Corinne, you might want to stop the music in the background because I'm hearing it on the monitor. Thank you. So part of that piece, then, is who's going to be around to do those things. So part of the theory 
of the time is that immigrants <coughs> come from a criminal culture. Okay? And that criminal culture is the same thing as their ethnicity. And the people that they're writing about, and these are wasps writing about <coughs> Norwegians, Swedes, Bohemians, Slavs, Russians, Irish, Scottish, Italians. <coughs> Those people come from an inferior ethnic culture, and that's why they go to crime. That's what the gang literature of the time, I'm talking about like 1919, 1927, and they're talking about the setting being Chicago. And the gangs in New York. And the gangs in New York. <coughs> so if you look at those, those personalizations, gangs in New York, who is that? That's the Irish gangs, right? Is there anything particularly criminal about being Irish? Or who would criminalize being Irish? Hmm. Would that be black people? Hmm, no. The English? Yeah. Ben Franklin didn't like Germans living in Philadelphia. Is that because the Germans were mercenaries for the English? Partially. <coughs> but he felt they were part of a criminal culture too. So. You have this, this idea, then, this, this idea of these were ethnics, these were non-whites, these were not considered white people, European immigrants. They were considered criminal. Hold on a second, right? So when we talk about gangs in Eugene, because that's your original question, right? Okay, we got gangs in Eugene. Why do we have gangs in Eugene? For the same reason you have gangs anywhere, except unlike what you've been seeing on recent television shows, and I'm calling them out again. In 1992, with well, that story that I talked about, when I, when I was talking about memetics, which is not part of the literature because nobody was talking about memes back then, and now they're kind of, it's kind of hip and trendy, but they're not thinking about gang, you know, that, applying that concept to gangs. And, you know, I just received the news that I'm being barred from presenting at the gang symposium this very stuff, so I don't care. This is going out. This is on YouTube. It's all right. Whatever. Here's the thing. Why would 80%, this is when I'm talking about with that uh, phenomenon of those two kids, 80% of the what they call black-style gang members are white kids in Oregon. That's from the police saying that. And one thing you can count on with military organization is they do want to get some of their facts straight in terms of threat analysis. Okay? 80% of the black style. Well, you can't call it black style if 80% of the kids are white. So they said LA style, like that is different. But the phenomenon was these ki white kids were getting jumped in by black gang members and basically doing the same work drug dealing or whatever, but the literature did not account for what's their motivation. It ain't poverty. Why does the son of a, you know, police chief want to become a gangster crip? They don't have an explanation for that. It's cool. Cool? No, they're getting shot at. They're shooting people. They could get killed. Or it could be like, that scene, that gang scene in Bamboozled, if you haven't seen that, which actually came from a real event, where they kill all the black gang members and the white kid is left standing. Because he's considered by the, oh, you'll just grow out of it. Unless you're both Flynn, which he didn't grow out of it. Question? Yeah. Having that social equation on the board, you know, in the criminal background, Ah, glad you asked. You anticipated the next couple of slides. To be answered. Someone over here? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, 
So who was the, as you say, you know, the Norwegians, the, the Bohemians? What, 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 what ethnicity was? They're, well, they're considered white now. Yeah, but who, who was out of that circle? Like, who, what ethnicity? The, the British, the Germans, who was calling the rest of the group that they are not whites? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans. Where did they come from? Well, they were immigrants. But they were immigrants, of course, you know, um, in the uh, 1600s with the Dutch colonies. So, for example, New York City was once called New Amsterdam because of the Dutch. Right? So successive waves of people. I mean, the state of Oregon was once in danger of becoming part of the British Empire. So the idea was to bring in more American settlers in the mid-1800s so that the population by itself would then take the Oregon Territory, which is then part of Oregon and the state of Washington, and take it away from the British by basically flooding it with white Americans. And even they were also trying, within the state of Oregon, bring in white foreigners to become American citizens. So this whole question of immigration has been a real interesting one, and it's changed. Who's the design? Oh, look, Arnold Schwarzenegger was an illegal immigrant. Illegal immigrant. Now, eventually he became a naturalized citizen, but he came here as an illegal immigrant. Now, nobody chasing after him, but that's why he can't run for president, because of how he came here. But who makes those rules? Those are not the rules that are being made by the people here before 1492. So it's people who came later, right? So, so there's an above ground and an underground economy. People try and make their needs. So what happens then is you have, as these immigrants are allowed to become white and move up, that leaves a vacuum for the underground economy. And so successive waves of immigrants or other people fill the gap. It's kind of a pressure <laughs> social system. Yes. Because when you move out to the above the, the uh, ground, you have uh, more privilege. Right. Right. You can buy privilege. Okay? You might have been a criminal, but your kids can go to Harvard. Because now you got the money from running rum or whatever. Right? So, when I first saw in 1984, Peter Jennings, ABC News, drugs, why this plague? And he said, drug dealing gangs have invaded the heartland of America. And there's this whole map with all, let's lit up. I'm saying, wow, that's the interstate system. How did black drug dealing gangs suddenly take over the mafia territory? So if you didn't know that story, the Italian Mafia once controlled the drug trade in America. <coughs> Primarily, the Teamsters Union, truckers, long haul truck drivers, keep them wired on methamphetamine or whatever. I remember the first pot, first time I bought pot, you, you understand I inhaled, from the LA music industry. You could get pot, this is before there was sense me in domestic marijuana growing, so you either got pot from the Mexicans or you got pot from the Mafia. And we got pot from the Mafia. Right? So, once the Mafia had gotten enough money so they can buy Warner Brothers records or insurance companies or legitimate businesses, they don't need to bother with street drug sales, so they leave a void. And they left that void as early as uh, the 1980s. I mean, that's what I was talking about with that whole analysis of, wait, Crips and Bloods do not speak Spanish. They do not speak Hebrew. How are they getting Uzis? How are they getting cocaine? Because they ain't going to Colombia. And why would the Colombians suddenly make deals with street gangs for guns and weapons, like out of nothing? No, that got facilitated by somebody. 
And we will talk about that when we come to that time period later in the 21st century. But the idea is that gangs have been around for a while. <coughs> gangs in Eugene basically have been fed by the same conditions that feed gangs, which we'll get into. So that whole Kawaita analysis of global to individual to informal group, you gotta look at the economics. There is something supporting gang activity. Gangs are making money. Well, how are they making money and who are they selling to? Hmm. They're not selling to their own communities because drugs are really expensive, right? There, drugs are really expensive. So, came back into town, looked at, I saw, I went out last night and saw um, 42, a movie about the Jackie Robinson story. <coughs> so, of course, it's Hollywood, so it's not the whole story, just some of the story, but even that part that they show is not bad. So now America gets to see how its all-American game came to be integrated. Okay, one person, and you can see the resistance that happened to him, you could see basically the type one-isms, you know, him getting called, and this is the part that I love, so I'm just going to broadcast it. Tar Baby in 1947 ain't no metaphor. Used in the same sense, nigger, tar baby, porch <coughs> monkey, okay? Ain't no metaphor. Ain't no emotionally sticky situation, okay? The movie portrayed it. <laughs> exactly. Right? Guy was a military officer, fought for his country, but all they can see is nigger? Good baseball player. All they can say, oh, you have to prove yourself, steal bases, you still have to perform. Okay. So now in a certain day in April, you now they all wear 42 and the number has been retired. Kumbaya. You know. I was reading uh, in the LA, LA Times, Magic Johnson. You've heard of Magic Johnson, right? So, got enough spare money, bought interest in, in the team, the Dodgers. And basically made the point that African-American participation in baseball is lower than at its, now than at its peak, 8%. Used to be like up to 20. Because, you know, everybody wants to be a football player, a basketball player, but baseball players make some bank too. All right. So, we'll do a personal crash analysis, and I'll leave some of these on the website rather than kill trees for you. Connect some of the crash dots. I haven't shown you the guys this, right? Okay, so, to start simple, class, race, age, sex, heterosex, crash. That's five, right? But, of course, there's more than one level. So I can expand to ten. Let's start with the basic five. So the analysis came out of racism studies. But we recognize that racism isn't the only form of discrimination that people face. Sometimes people face multiples coming at them at the same time. So to overlay on that, so six types of isms. So ism is individual, structural, and social mentality. And this came out of what we now call critical race theory, but back in the day we just, just called it, okay, racism studies. But we also figured it out because of <coughs> what's now called intersectionality, 
that lots of different people have the same have different characteristics coming at them all at once. So six isms. So type one. It's basically overt individual. You saw that with, in, if you see the Jackie Robinson film, yeah, they're calling him nigger, porch monkey, blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah, blah, right? Over an attack, physical or verbal attack. Type two, covert individual. usually called microaggressions. This again came out of black psychiatry, where it says, okay, they're gonna stop calling you nigger at some point, it'll be made illegal or unprofitable or whatever. And so they're still doing other things that are just as powerful but kind of in a gray area because they become so normalized, they're like everyday interactions. Now, some of, and uh, so some of those were, have I talked about Chet Pierce yet? Okay, so as an example. So understand that what I'm telling you the American Psychological Association does not recognize existing. They do not believe that racism has any psychological or emotional impact on you at all. At least nothing that they are going to, you know, put in their book and so that you can seek counseling for it. They're not going to do it. To this day, which if you understand their history, then okay, that makes sense. And we'll talk about that in a little while. So, Chet Pierce, Chester M. Pierce, Navy Commodore, Harvard trained black psychiatrist. Navy wants to study what makes people go crazy in Antarctica. They got bases there, they got people stationed there for six months. <laughs> It's dark, it's 100 degrees below zero. What makes you go crazy in Antarctica? Because they got to know. So Chet studies that environment. And what he finds is, oh, well, it's not that it's 100 degrees below zero. You can't do nothing about that. It's not that it's dark for six months. You can't do nothing about that. What starts getting under your skin is the little interactions between people. They start getting in under your skin and build up and build up until they like explode. Or maybe you can't explode because it was not really nothing. I didn't really mean anything by it. Jungle Bunny. You're just too sensitive. Bitch. Oh, I didn't mean bitch, I mean biatch. Or, or whatever, right? Now, that's a little over the line because those are overt, right? Because those, you know, those terms have been used as attack and now they've been overused like as if they left their sting. So let me be more clean about the microaggression. Oh, you don't look the way you sound over the phone to me. Oh, I sound taller? I get that a lot. Oh, yeah. You're really smart for a, then no, I'd say the four, but the, how am I supposed to talk? I'm a black professional, living in a predominantly white state, working for a predominantly white organization. You think I'm going to say, yo, yo, what's up to Mary Spilding? I mean, I might. In Price Chopper. Not here. Speaking with Queen's English. Right. Okay, so Chet basically says, okay, 
<laughs> here's the work with microaggressions. He comes back and being a black, black psychiatrist, he says, being black in America is like living in Antarctica. They're not calling you nigger every day. They're basically doing all these kind of little interactions that get under your skin. You're a doctor with an MD or a PhD, and you're shopping at Saks Fifth Avenue, where since you live in Beverly Hills, it's just like down the street, and security is following you. You're LeVar Burton, reading Rainbow, Star Trek, driving yourself to the Paramount lot in your BMW, and Popo pulls you over week after week after week as if you've stolen that BMW and you're not a movie star. They didn't call you nigger. Miles Davis was driving this Ferrari down the Coast Highway and we kept getting pulled over. Yeah. Coast Highway in LA, right? PCH. Yeah, right. Do you know how many Ferraris are in Malibu? I mean, come on, it's practically like Priuses. Well, there's Priuses too, but it's not worthy of comment. But yeah, Miles getting pulled over in his Ferrari. Like, right. Oh, you're not supposed to be? That's a microaggression, right? So people have improved on Chet's work because that work was done in the early 70s, right? But unless you are in the family of a black psychiatrist or where that's a family friend, you wouldn't know about it. Right? You're not going to learn about it in the contemporary psychology taught on this campus, either. Because again, you have to basically know the connect. The work is published. I mean, I did say Harvard. I did say Navy Commodore. Uh, there's some credibility there, right? So there are nine separate species of microaggressions, because people have expanded the work. And we'll be showing, sharing you with that, too. Type three. Is the first level, so the, the first two are individual. Okay, committed by individual. So the other four are all institutional. Institutional. So this type three is unconscious. Well, how can an institution be unconscious? All it has to not be aware of is that people within it are doing type one and two within it, and then make no policy against it. So it's a stage of evolution. Right at the moment, at Lane Community College, as most institutions, it follows the case law. The Supreme Court recognizes nigger as a fighting word. It's illegal to use it in the federal workplace. You can get sued. Your employer can get sued if they allow people to go undisciplined or unfired, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, within it, theoretically. Case law backs that. But it's not so good on microaggressions, which obviously, this is predictable, right? You get bopped by somebody you call the, the wrong word, a fighting word. That's why it's called a fighting word. Because I can assume if you call me an egger, uh, you're about to do violence. So I can preemptively strike you. Works for nations, works for people. You bop a kid, they stop calling you the n-word. Immediate feedback. So they shift into other things. Oh, tar baby. It's a tar baby situation. Like they're trying to rewrite history. Oh, it's not a racial word. Dictionary says it's not a racial word. But you don't hear that so much. Uh, yeah, in Eugene you do. Really? I've heard it. Wow. It was actually said in this work. This workplace. Seems like it should be a back this Yeah, you would, you would yeah. think that it would be. But dude said he cited the dictionary and even cited Wikipedia that said, oh, it's not a racial term. Really? Wow. Wikipedia said that? That is not the experience of black people. And Jackie Robinson, 42, showed you that. 
Uh, institutional racism, so unconscious. So the institution is unconscious that people are doing type two or one or two within it. So then obviously it's to create policies and make the institution conscious. Type four is conscious. And the re now, when I'm tell telling you about crash, <coughs> understanding these are up to 10 separate discriminators. What does H mean again? Heterosexism. We used to call it homophobia, but it's actually just, it's not just being scared of sexual diversity. Oh, I've got gay friends. Oh, I had a gay friend in high school. They used to say that about black people. Oh, I'm not racist. I had a black friend in high school. <laughs> actually said, he actually said that. Now they say, I voted for Obama. Well, I, yeah, I voted for Obama. Yeah, OK. So conscious racism where racism is legal. So remember, this is basically came out of essentially black studies, right? African American experience. Just talking about our psychology. This is what our scientists came up with, you know, in terms of how do you deal with, you know, above ground, or below ground economy issues, among other things, right? So, uh, state of Oregon, Nazi Germany, Jim Crow South, apartheid South Africa. You know. Discrimination is legal, and they do it. They carry it out. Ain't no ifs, ands, or buts. So you have to have an organized civil rights movement to change that over a long period of time. Conscious, type five, illegal. Remember, it's an institution. The reason they keep doing it is that discrimination is profitable. So let's say you can't be auditorially profiled on the phone. You call up for an apartment. You show up. Oh, we just rented the apartment. Or you're applying for a job. You're dressed. You have the experience. You turn your application in. You leave. They file 13 your application. It's illegal. All those things are illegal. But they do them because, oh, well, we want a front office look, and that means blonde hair, blue eyes. Or we don't want your kind in our institution. That don't happen in Titan Court, right? <laughs> you complete the fifth on that, it's all right. All right, so type five. Type six, here's where the body count is, socio-structural violence. Okay, so normal socialized actions of society. Now, this is where, in, in trying to explain what type six is, sociostructural violence is, people want to say, well, that's conspiracy theory. No, it's not a conspiracy theory if you are already socialized to carry out this discrimination as part of a normal part of society. You're socialized to think that a certain type of immigrants are, are crime ridden. Now, even before, so even when we say, for example, because I was reading, again, in the LA Times, because that's down where I was, where they're talking about terms that their style guide talks about. Like, if you're writing for them, you have to follow the style guide. And so when they talk about illegal immigrants, and they recognize, oh, that's an inaccurate term. Because... If you think illegal immigrants means Mexicans, 
Uh, what about Arnold Schwarzenegger? What about the co guy that killed Ennis Cosby? I heard the question. Come on, speak it up. Who's Ennis Cosby? Venture a wild guess. Bill Cosby's son. Bill Cosby's son. Where was he killed? And who killed him? Nope. Nope. Ennis Cosby was a medical student, almost a doctor, <coughs> a medical doctor, helping a white female friend of his change her flat tire in Bel Air on the side of the freeway on the 405. He got jacked by a Russian immigrant who said, I shot a nigger. Please tell me how a Russian immigrant gets into the country and kills a black doctor in Bel Air. What were they screening for? Did he get his racism in Russia? There is racism in Russia. Or did he get it here? I shot a nigger. Not, I shot a medical student in Bel Air, helping somebody on the freeway. I shot a nigger. Where did he get that attitude? Why wasn't that attitude screened out for? Why? OK. When we talk about illegal immigrants, how many Mexicans have killed black doctors in rich white neighborhoods? Should we be afraid? I'm just saying, illegal immigrants, we think about, oh, the, and the press is talking about, hmm, that term is slippery because how come we're thinking about 12 million people from Latin America and not half a million people from Europe and Canada? Because I can tell you the Canadians, I mean, Jay Leno even does a bit of, did a bit about this, you know, haha, -ha, half a million Canadians. The Canadians ain't doing farm work. They ain't washing dishes or gardening. They're taking jobs that Americans could do. What happened to Ellis Island? Your Pope sent us your poor, your hungry, and your suffering. Right. Well, so illegal immigrants, well, that just means you were here, you overstayed your visa, you crossed illegally, you overstayed your visa. Blah, 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 blah. You ain't up on your paperwork. Half a million of those are white. How come nobody's looking for them? Because certainly in the case of Ennis Cosby, uh, we weren't, Mexicans weren't endangering us. Ain't nobody looking out for Russians. Ain't nobody looking out for the Canadians. And I'm just saying, I'm not focusing necessarily racially, but you know, as the lecture talked about last week, okay, there's a interesting racial quotas and racial dynamics within immigration. That's socio-structural violence. That doesn't require a conspiracy. That's just normal practice. Where did you social? How come illegal immigrants shift from Irish to now Mexicans? Without even making the distinction that there are not just ethnic Mexicans coming in here that speak from Spanish-speaking countries. Right? So that level of you know, social structural violence actually has a lot of different implications to it. <coughs> All right, so talking about then crash, we re recognize even though we were doing the work on racism, that these isms, these six isms, also operate along these other characteristics too. So just to fill in some of those blanks. So above the line, you have privilege. Below the line, you're targeted. And these are Word documents I'll put up on the site so you can do your own analysis about how you're targeted too. So they interact. So all 10. So classism, racism, religion, spirituality is like R squared. So it would be like. C 
R squared A cubed S H. And it's basically a, a model that Remy Callalang and I de designed basically to talk about intersectionality. Intersectionality, among other places, was invented as a concept in the 70s by the Kombai River uh, Collective. It's a feminist statement. It's black feminist lesbians who basically said, look, when we're fighting a feminist struggle against sexism, our white sisters are with us. But when those same white sisters cross the street at our non-homophobic black sons, we got a problem. They're not dealing with their racism. We have to deal with racism. They, white lesbians can be seps, separatists. Decide, okay, we're going to live in our own communities, not have to deal with any man except when we come to town. Well, black lesbians can't do that for a variety of intersect intersecting reasons, like, okay, we got to deal with racism, we have to partner with black men to do that, because they're targets too. We might have to deal with their sexism, but what heterosexual white woman doesn't have to deal with sexism? Duh. Okay, but we can basically fight that struggle with them. And we can fight a class struggle. And we can fight a, right? So rather than get into an oppression Olympics, that is, who's more oppressed than who? Like, let's see, a blind, black, lesbian in a wheelchair, who's Muslim? She's more oppressed than anybody, if she's poor. No, stop. That's crazy. What if she's a CEO? Does being CEO trump all the other stuff? Not necessarily. All right? So we go start with class. So above the line, rich, middle class, wealthy. And so basically where your wealth is sustained beyond work, that is, your money works for you you don't have to work for your money. Let's say at about $80,000 and above, middle class, whatever that def definition is. Here's the problem with that, and this is where you're targeted below the line, <laughs> right? Two, poor could be defined as 200% of the poverty level, or if your wealth can be wiped out by one bad medical bill or disability and you're not rich and basically, so for example, less than $80,000. So for example, you can be in the Southwest and get stung by a scorpion and a scorpion, anti you need to get two doses of the scorpion anti-venom and it costs 40 grand a hit. Boom, an $80,000 medical bill, would that, put a significant dent in your financial well-being? If, so, if that's so for you, you're below the line, even if you are middle class. I, that would affect me. I'm a college professor. I would be above the line. But if I have a bad medical bill, below the line. You have to be two paychecks away from homeless. Right. Most people are being two paychecks away from being homeless and three paychecks away from, you know, revolution or starving in the streets or whatever. All right, so class. Race. Above the line is white and whites in quotes because who defines what that is? That has shifted. And white doesn't necessarily mean skin color, but it could. Now, not portrayed within this model is the fact that within a group, you can have intra, inside a group, prejudice and isms. Okay, we didn't put that in it because that's another level of complication. But understand that that is part of it and that's part of the whole study. Lighter skin, skin color gets privileged, darker skin color gets less privileged. So white and non-white. 
religion, spirituality. So, the Abrahamic, re the Abrahamic religions have a priority over non-Abrahamic -Abra religions within this country. So, Protestant, Catholic, Mormon is above the line simply because we had a Mormon candidate for president. We've never had a Jewish candidate for president. They may, we've had two Catholic presidents. So they're above the line in terms of power, right? Non-Christian, Abrahamic. So, would you agree that Jewish comes above Muslim in terms of power and privilege? Yes, definitely. <coughs> Muslim. So, the Abrahamic religions. And so, who's considered a religion? Two. There, there's another piece with that. Buildings. <coughs> who, has, who gets to have centers of worship? And who doesn't? Well, what if my spiritual belief doesn't believe in... No, what if I believe, for example, I'm native? And I say, look, no house of worship made by hands can trump a mountain or a forest or an ocean. I'm sorry. Sistine Chapel is pretty, but so is Everest. What, what y'all are making is nothing compared to the glory of creator. But, I can't keep you, if I was Lakota, and I say, can you not climb on what you call in English the devil's tower, what in, my, in Lakota language is the bear's lair, can you not climb on that for the month of August, white folks? No. We have our rights. This is a national park. We don't care that it's part of your sacred Black Hills. Sacred Black Hills? What's so sacred about the Black Hills? Well, that's not your call to make. All right? So, let's go back to the chart. So, non abrahamic So, Hindu Sikhs, well, they can have a temple. Buddhists, they can have a temple. But Native American, Native spirituality, was illegal in the United States before 1978. Illegal. So they couldn't even have sacred sites. Oh, here, let me pose a question for you. This is torn out of the headlines. What if, it's a crazy concept, but bear with me. This is for illustration. What if Apache ninjas raided the Vatican, stole sacred objects, brought them back to the United States, and sold them to private art collectors. What if they did that? And then an American court said, oh, tough luck, private property. Sorry, Catholic Church. Our bad. Besides, that happened a long time ago. Here's what a French court did. The Hopi Nation had 16 sacred masks that were not supposed to be shown outside of the tribe, ever. They got stolen in the 1930s and sold to private collectors of art in Europe. A French court just ruled against the United States and the tribe Sorry, we ain't giving them back. We're, go we're selling them in auction. Robert Redford even weighed in and said, no, you shouldn't be doing that. This is, there's a print. Well, no, it's private now. Sorry. So would that have happened with the Catholics? Uh, no. Okay, so I'm sure the Hopi did not sell these objects. They were stolen, probably by white Americans. Oh, they're interesting anthropological artifacts. That was just a news item two days ago. Okay, so who's above the line, who's below the line? See how that works? That's why 
R squared, right? religion, spirituality is under racism. Easy way, easy way to look at that. Back to, yeah, thank you. So, native spirituality, pagan, Wiccan, Odinist, Rastafarian, African, Aramaic, Christian. Hey, nobody's heard about those. Might have heard of Rastafarianism, but Rastafarianism isn't just about smoking weed if it's about smoking weed at all, which it isn't. You have Rastas that don't. Right. Within that framework. <coughs> Age. Next category. Above the line, between the ages of 30 and 50. If you're below 30 or 50, you are targeted. You don't have privilege. So marketability. Can't be you need to be young, but not too young. You could be old, but not too old. And so targeted below the line, youth or elder. Ability. Uh, so ability is basically, so what T-A-B-M, T-A-B uh, plus or and M, temporarily able-bodied. Okay? Because part of growing old is you get a disability. Stuff stops working. Your mental faculties start going. Your mind starts slipping. Okay, can you hold it together? Can you, you know, not develop a mental illness? You can, and you appear able-bodied, the world is your oyster. Okay, above the line. Below the line, Disability, physical, mental, or addictions. And so, if you're in recovery from addiction, that is, if you've not used for a day, you're covered by the Americans with Disability Act, but you have to keep not using. So, addictions. Some addictions have privilege above the line. That if you're addicted to legal, so-called legal drugs, like alcohol. It's not illegal to be an alcoholic. It's not illegal to be physically addicted to prescription drugs if you're on a prescription. Below the line, oh, non-prescription, prescription drug use. Sexism, male. And below the line, female or girls or people who are expressing boundaries. We have problems with actually people who are ambiguous. Tomboys, trans, who uses what bathroom? Heterosexism. So the privilege goes to heterosexuals. Below the line, what we call LGBTQIAA, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer questioning, intersexed or asexual or other. There are other frameworks that operate within this. Then also looks. Are you attractive? What, what do we define as attractive? Blonde hair, blue eyed, straight hair, not too tall, not too short, below the line, darker skin, large, short, other height issues, hygiene, clean versus not. So just from here, all 10 of these interact. So for example, if I were going to do me, I'm above the line on class, below the line on race, I can pass for Christian, so I can straddle that line. I'm below the line on age. I'm above the line on ability. I'm above the line on addiction. I'm above the line on sexism and heterosexism. Because I have privilege in all those places or I can be targeted, right? So you can do this for you. And say, okay, so, hmm, how do these affect me? And you can add other things in terms of who you decide you love. 
Should you stay within your race? Marry outside of your religion? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Rich, poor, educated, non. That's right. It changes. I've just done this just for an American thing, but this would change completely, and some of these categories would fall off the map entirely in another culture. So I'm just explaining an American context, because this came out of African American science. Like, okay, let's look at these barriers. They're invisible. But we have to train people for them by acknowledging them that, that they exist. And part of, you know, well, we definitely know that they exist because we're affected by them. Do a little exercise. Have you seen this? Okay. Draw nine dots on a piece of paper in front of you. 